This lecture is meant to kind of summarize the article that you read on the Mesoproterozoic Mid-Continental Rift System in the Lake Superior region of the United States. So here is the mainland of Michigan, and here is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, or the UP. Um, and you can see that the the rift zone, which is often referred to as the Kiwinawan Rift Zone, and that's named after one of these little peninsulas here, is called the Kiwinawan um, Peninsula in the UP. Um, the Kiwinawan Rift Zone extends from a bit of mainland Michigan underneath much of the UP, underneath Lake Superior and down through Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa and even into Kansas um, and Nebraska at its furthest extent. So this really large rift system is kind of cool because it's an ancient um, look at what happens when continents rift apart or what can happen when continents rift apart. This is a figure from your textbook, and you'll see that it highlights some of the national parks that are found within the mid-continental rift system, which formed during the Mesoproterozoic Eon. Um, so you can see there's Pictured Rocks uh, National Landmark. This is Isle Royale National Park, which is an island, and I really want to go there one day. Uh, this is Grand Portage National Monument, Apostles Island National Landmark, um, and then you can see there's a couple others as well. So um, to give you just a quick overview, and again, you read this and you, you reported on it, so that's great. Um, this is a 2,000 kilometer long rip zone, and a kilometer is, that's like about um, a little bit more than 1,000, maybe 1,200 miles in length. And if we were to measure the distance from one side of the rift to the other, we're looking at an offset of more than 100 kilometers, so about 60 miles or so um, across in some locations. And the rift itself is characterized by lots of volcanic rock. So volcanic rock not only means igneous rock, but it means that the igneous rock erupted at the surface. And then there are overlying sedimentary rocks, some of which are mixed in with some of the volcanics, and most of which are just kind of deposited on top of the volcanics. There are high angle normal faults located on either side of this rift, and we know that normal faults are typically associated with rifting systems, um, with extensional tectonics, so that makes sense. And this whole rift system created a very large graben. Um, which is the axis of which just kind of flows where you can see these igneous rocks um, that kind of come through the center of the rift zone. Um, and a graben again forms when you have extensional tectonics and a block falls down and then the two portions on either side of the rift are called horse and those were uplifted. So this uh, lecture really just kind of summarizes what are the main points of the review article. So the article notes that after a decade or more of research that a lot of the volcanism that occurred occurred during the active rift of, rifting phase. Um, once the rifting phase was done, you had uplift of the horse and erosion of those horse, horse and the sedimentation um, after rifting was largely erosion of those horse that fell down into and was deposited within the graben. In the central zone, you had an overabundance of mafic igneous rock. Remember, mafic means that it's predominantly composed of magnesium and iron, dark in color, uh, low viscosity lava. And that's really common, um, not only when you have very thin crust, like you have when you're rifting continents apart, but also when you have a mantle plume, which we'll be talking about later, where you have a large bulb of lava that's coming up from the lower mantle. So what happens when rifting is done is to the east, there is a very large mountain building event that occurs where North America collides with a couple other continents and creates the ancestral Appalachian Mountains. So this mountain building event is called the Grenville Orogeny. Orogeny just means mountain building event. And the faults that were already there, these normal faults were actually reactivated during the um, Grenville Orogeny and inverted the normal faults. So instead of the hanging wall moving down, they turned the Grenville orogeny turned a lot of these normal faults into reverse faults where due to compression from the east, hanging walls began moving up. So they turned normal faults, the orogeny turned or normal faults into reverse faults. 
a lot of the volcanic material, it was subaerially um, cooled. Subaerial means beneath the air, and that's because this was um, igneous material that erupted on the surface, so beneath the air, um, as opposed to um, cooling intrusively. 90% of it is a flood basalt. Flood basalts are really low viscosity basalts that as the name implies kind of floods the land. And about 10% of it, it, the volcanics are rhyolite. And we'll talk about the source for the, um, the silica that created the rhyolite. The sedimentary rocks, which are largely deposited above the volcanic rocks, are for, were deposited in alluvial fans, which form as you have sediment that is deposited from the eroding horse as well as fluvial deposits, which we know are from rivers, and lacustrine deposits, which form in lakes. So estuarine deposits form in what are called estuaries. Estuaries will form where you have rivers that flow into um, the ocean and you have mixing of fresh and salt water. And so the region is typically referred to as an estuary. Okay. So the next section focuses on tectonics and structure of the mid-continental rift zone. So based on rubidium strontium dating um, in orthoclase, um, which, so rubidium is the parent isotope here and strontium is the daughter isotope, um, it appears that faulting occurred around 1060 million years ago or 1.06 billion years ago um, in, the Neo, in the Mesoproterozoic. Many of the rocks experience or exhibit what's called burial metamorphism. Burial metamorphism is a really low grade metamorphism that basically occurs when sedimentary rocks get buried at very great depths and at great depths, temperature and pressure will go up and so you start to have a very low grade metamorphism. However, now these rocks with burial metamorphism are at the surface of the earth. Um, and near Lake Superior, which suggests that the Horst in Minnesota, at least, which is where the burial, the rocks with burial grade metamorphism were observed, were deeply buried and then along motion along the foot wall of the faults was uplifted significantly so that now that these rocks that have underwent burial metamorphism are exposed at the surface. So one of the reasons I wanted you to see this paper was not only because it summarized a lot of really interesting research um, in this area, but also because it introduced a lot of important types of figures that you will see um, as you go on in geology. And the first one really shows up in the section on paleomagnetism and radiometric dating. So based on um, some evidence of from paleomag evidence, rifting began during a period of what's called reverse polarity around 1105 to 1102 million years ago. So right now we live in a time of what's considered normal polarity, where if you go outside, your compass will point to the magnetic north pole. Um, but reverse polarity is exactly what it sounds like. It's a time in during Earth's history where um, compasses would have pointed to the magnetic south pole. And that's due to fluctuations that aren't really very well understood in the outer core of the, uh, the outer core of the Earth, because the fluctuations of liquid iron and nickel within the outer core of the Earth are what generate the Earth's magnetic field to begin with. So this is a really cool but really complicated diagram. So let's go through it a little bit slowly. Um, this is a correlation diagram, and here you have the age of the rocks, the group that they're within, which is called the Kiwi Now and Supergroup, and then this area, this column demonstrates magnetic polarity. So R stands for reverse polarity, N for normal polarity, and you can see that there are switches within the, the Kiwi Now and Supergroup rocks that we're looking at. So there were Kiwi Now and Supergroup rocks examined in five locations, and that's what is going across the top here. So there were rocks recovered from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and the eastern shore of Lake Superior. And then these are the rocks that you find in Thunder Bay, Ontario. It's called the Osler Group, and it was it formed um, during volcanic processes during this rever period of reverse polarity. So by studying the orientation of the iron-rich minerals inside the Osler Group, geologists have determined that when the lava flow from the Osler Group was traversing across 
uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, the iron rich minerals align themselves with the magnetic south pole, at least in the beginning. Um, you can see that at the end of the Osler group, the volcanic rocks re uh, record the reverse back to normal polarity right around here, right? So, um, so that gives us a good age constraint for um, this shift in polarity gives us a good age constraint for when um, the rocks were deposited. In fact, that's called a chronostratigraphic datum. So uh, the magnetic pole inversion, because that's a global event. So when we can record that reverse polarity in the rocks, that's something that happened not just in Thunder Bay, Ontario, but all around the entire world. And so chronostratigraphic means, chrono means time, and stratigraphic means correlation, correlation of time, and datum it just means data point. So it's correlation of time using this reverse polarity. And in Minnesota, we can see that in the North Shore Volcanic Group, that's again, that um, 1109 uh, plus or minus 4 million years fits there. Um, and it's observed in Wisconsin and Michigan, in the Powder Mill Group, and also in Lake Superior. So what this tells us is the way that this um, diagram has been created, that the solar church formation in Minnesota was deposited at the same time as the Oronto group in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So similarly, um, the Hinkley sandstone was deposited around the same time as the Devil's Island sandstone in Wisconsin, as par part of the Jacobsville sandstone in Michigan, and, and the Jacobsville sandstone as exposed in Lake Superior. Um, the other thing is that the tilt of the iron rich minerals that are within these volcanic rocks also point, they're also tilted um, so that they're pointed towards the magnetic North Pole. And so based on the orientation of those iron rich minerals, it indicates to geologists that these rocks were deposited and cooled at lower latitudes, so closer to the equator. And then finally, using uranium lead dating, where uranium is a very slow decaying isotope that decays to lead, the major volcanic pulses based on, so with uranium lead dating, we can get minerals, um, usually zircons, which trap some uranium in them. And we can use that to figure out when most of these volcanic rocks were deposited. There were major volcanic pulses right around 1109, a uh, million years ago, which is right around the time of the magnetic reversal, and also around 1100 million years ago, based on lots of radiometric age studies. So this sort of a diagram is something that you could expect on your first test. And the idea is just to be able to t look at rock layers like the Frida sandstone and know that the Frida sandstone formed during a time of normal polarity and the Frida sandstone is deposited around the same time, for example, as the solar uh, church formation. So a good diagram to kind of look over and make sure you kind of understand how it is created. The next section has to do with magmatism. And this was an incredibly huge volume of uh, magnet of uh, igneous material extruded. Um, the extrusive volume is over 2 million cubic kilometers, but there's about the same amount of that that cooled intrusively based on um, dikes that have been recovered, uh, that have been identified that date to the same exact time. Um, oftentimes when there are multiple dikes that are sort of emplaced and cool at the same time, geologists will refer, refer to those as dike swarms. The article reports that there is very few volcanic edifices. So an edifice is anything that kind of sticks above ground, like a volcano or a spatter cone volcano or a cinder cone volcano or a volcanic neck. Um, most of the volcanic material in this setting um, erupted through fissures, which are just literally like little tears in the earth. So it just kind of came up and pooled and filled in parts of the graben, um, but not forming really necessarily volcanoes. The correlation of this uh, volcanic rock is through phenocrysts, which you'll remember from 101 are the larger crystals in a igneous rock with two grain sizes, and through looking at the geochemistry. So this is the second type of 
um, diagram that I think is important in this article. This is called a ternary diagram because it has um, three ap apexes like on a triangle. Um, so there are different, um, different elements, I guess, compounds that are on either at, at each apex of this triangle. So the top here, if something plotted right here would be 100% iron oxide, that's a FeO. And if it plotted down here, if the chemical analysis of a rock plotted down here, it would be 100% magnesium oxide, MgO. Um, and then if it plotted over here, it would be 100% alkali minerals. Um, and alkali minerals are typically uh, sodium and potassium and aluminum, light-colored minerals. Um, and this is the geochemical analysis of a lot of the rocks that are associated with the mid-continental rift system. So based on the abundance of iron, alkali minerals, and magnesium, that controls how we name rocks. Um, and so when you go on in geology and you take a class in petrology, you look at ternary diagrams like this all the time. Um, so if a rock has roughly equal amounts of iron and alkali metals in it, um, it would plot right here. If it had slightly more alkali metals than, um, than iron and no magnesium, it would plot in this area. And this is where the chemically where the rhyolites are found in, um, in the MRZ. And then, so there's a lot of words on here you may not know, uh, but there are a few that are familiar. So andesite, if you recall from physical geology, is a rock that is intermediate in composition. It's half dark colors, half light colors and it will um it, it plots sort of similarly because alkali metals are very light in color iron it is darker in color magnesium is darker in color so this has um just a little bit less than half of light colored metals um, and a little bit more iron than magnesium so this is where andesite would plot and then you can see that there are rocks all the way over in composition to basalt. So olivine is a very magnesium and iron rich mineral. It's green um, often. And you can see here that it has about the same amount of iron and magnesium because it's halfway between the F and the M there. And it's also very low in alkali metals. So it plots way down here. So this is, and basalt is, a dark mafic colored rock, which again has about equal amounts of iron and magnesium. So a lot of the rocks are really basaltic and that's what these rocks are here. As the rocks, as the basalt begins to melt up through some, don't worry about that, um, some of the old crust, because as we know, like igneous rocks have to erupt through something on their way to the surface, right? Magma chambers don't just like get to the surface through these magical tubes. They have to melt their way up through. And as they melt their way up through the older crust, which is called the Archean crust, the Archean is a time period that's even older than the Proterozoic. It's older than two and a half billion years old. Um, as it the, the basalt was melting its way up through some of this Archean crust. The Archean crust is really rich in alkali metals. So as it melts its way up through, it melts some of those alkali metals from the Archean crust into the basalt and it kind of mixes in. So kind of if you if you can think about, um, let's say that the basalt is kind of like when you start to make a cake and you have all your dry ingredients. So you have like your flour and your baking soda and your baking powder and your salt and I can't bake. So this is not a great analogy for me. Um, so you have that and it's kind of coming up and as it comes up through the crust, it melts parts of the crust and adds it in. So let's say that the crust, the Archean crust, it's full of like um, light colored alkali metals. So that's like adding your eggs in. When you add the eggs into your dry ingredients, it changes the overall composition of what your melted rock is. And that's how you get your rhyolite in this suite of rocks by melting in chunks of alkali metals and silica from the existing Archean crust. All right, so sedimentation is broken into a couple stages in this area. Prior to rifting, um, quartz sandstone was being deposited in the area and followed by some rocks that are relatively immature, um, which means that they haven't really been weathered very much from where they first um, 
are eroded to where they're deposited. And they're deposited within uh, layers of lava flows as well. Um, then you have the overlying volcanic rocks, as well as conglomerates, um, sandstones and shales that are full of rock fragments. So litho means rock fragments and feldspars means just um, that the rock fragments are really high in orthoclase and uh, plagioclase and other feldspar minerals. So here's another awesome diagram. And this um, this is a ternary diagram again, right? Because there's three, three different um, apexes. And this one is high concentrations of quartz, high concentrations of lithic fragments or rock fragments, and high concentration of feldspars. And these are the rock layers and where they plot. And you can see that there's very little feldspar in it, really. Lots of rock fragments and lots of quartz. And these are the rock layers that are deposited in the in the rift zone and they go from oldest here in the copper harbor to get progressively younger as you move up here so what this shows you is that while rocks were initially deposited um, after rifting that are very high in rock fragments right because lithic means rock fragments over time they become less uh, lithic in composition and more quartz rich and that makes sense if you think about the fact that the graben is stretching and getting further and further apart so initially you have rocks that are basically just falling down from the from the horse into the graben so they aren't transported very far but then as the graben continues to widen because the horse is pulling further and further apart um, the source of the sediment or the horse is further and further from where things are being deposited. So as the horst um, widens and the graben begins to fill, you go from a overall really lithic rich um, deposit to more quartz rich, which means that there's more and more and more weathering going on as the feature gets bigger and bigger. Um, and so, sorry, there's more sandstone and shale that gets deposited as you move further and as the horse continues to widen. So these rock layers are deposited in continental locations, a lot of braided river plains, um, some of them partly are in lakes as well. The mineralogy of this particular area is one of the reasons that people care about it in addition to it being beautiful. And that has to do with a really in, in large part the copper deposits that are associated with this volcanic activity. This is uh, the world's largest native copper mining district, meaning that it's pure copper. A lot of the volcanic material that came up from the lower mantle into the upper mantle was really, really rich in the mineral copper. And so consequently, there are many copper rich minerals that are mined in the area. A lot of the copper came up through warm water as it moved away from the magma chamber and that's hydrothermal, hot water origin of these fluids. One example of a rock layer that is really rich in copper is called the none such formation because there's none such formation like it. And there is a uh, copper sulfide mineral called calcasite, which looks like this, um, as well as native copper, which is copper colored, as you might imagine, as well as some of the oldest liquid petroleum on Earth that is associated um, with this event. And this is another um, just kind of copper sulfide rich mineral there in this particular sample is from the Duluth complex. Um, so there's lots of examples of minerals where copper reacted with sulfur um, or reacted with oxygen in um, ore fluids to produce really rich uh, minerals, including copper nickel sulfides. And this is one of the ways that we know that the mantle, that the volcanic material that came up was actually from the core, the lower mantle um, outer core, because there's a lot of nickel that came up with it. And again, nickel is really common in the core. Um, there's also what are called platinum group elements, which is PGE, um, that are also associated with this deposit.
So the discussion section kind of reiterates a lot of the points that we've already talked about, that the lava flows and the sediment was deposited in a non-marine environment, meaning, um, in fact, they were subaerially deposited, meaning they were deposited on land. Um, it's possible based on some of the rock layers that there was a brief period of time where seawater got in the area, but the red bed rocks that are deposited um, within the sedimentary rocks indicate a, the presence of a warm, humid climate, which is also kind of reiterated, right? Because we, um, with the latitude that was observed in the paleo mag data. So that's always nice when you have climate data that fits with some of your other data um, that kind of just confirms that your interpretation is correct. So where is all this red um, sediment coming from, the red coloration col coming from? It was coming from um, oxidation of hematite. So hematite you learned in um, physical geology is the chemical formula is Fe2O3. So it's iron and oxygen and it likely occurred right in place. So you have oxidation of iron rich metals in situ, which means like in place. Um, because you have a lot of iron rich minerals and mafic minerals, mafic minerals we know are all, uh, mafic rock fragments we know are also full of iron. So the iron that is in place oxidizes. And so again, this is a little redundant, but yeah, there is the general idea that we're at the equator. So in conclusion, this is a massive interior rift ba uh, basin that shows some really advanced, um, advanced continental rifting over a billion years ago. There are normal faults and some of the normal faults are a little curved. And so that's what Listrick means is a curved normal fault. Um, after we had extension, um, then as rocks cooled because the magma, because most of the magma was emptied into lava um, and sedimentation ended, then we know that historically this is followed by the uh, Grenville orogeny to the east, which basically reactivated normal faults and turned them into reverse faults because there was already structural weakness because the rocks were already broken in that area. So why was there a huge plume of magma? Um, it's actually called a mantle plume, and it's similar to the hotspot explanation, where deep in the man deep in the mantle, like lower mantle, again, especially given the amount of platinum group elements and uh, the richness of nickel in these deposits, you have a huge plume of mantle material that comes up to the surface. It pushes the um, overlying crust upwards, it fractures it into normal faults and you start to have rifting. And then as most of this uh, liquid magma erupts onto the surface as flood basalts, you then have erosion of the overlying rock layers and they fill in and uh, sedimentation here. So you have your flood basalts followed by your sedimentary rocks being deposited, and then you have a total change in the tectonic forces here, right? As we look about 900 million years ago, this is when the Grenville orogeny starts. So that is a not very short summary of a very dense article, um, but just kind of wanted to record this so you had a good understanding of what some of the highlights were.